Is it fair to my world? Couldn't handle the heat. Now I'm sleeping alone and I'm starting to freeze. Baby, come bring me help. Let it rain over me. Baby, come back to me. I want you to rule my life. You to rule my life. You to rule my life. Yeah. I want you to fuck up my nights. Yeah, fuck up my nights. Yeah, all my nights. Yeah. I want you to bring it all on if you make it all on. Then I'll make it all right. Yeah. I want you to ruin my life. You to ruin my life. You to ruin my life. I miss you. All right. Welcome back to another episode of Morning Coffee. I'm your host. I'm kind of gonna be your co-host today, Rick Alexander. I'm gonna be joined by host actual Danielle McGinnis. <laughs> Danielle, thanks for joining me. Thanks for having me as the host. (laughs) So for most of you, or some of you, I guess, that have been listening and following along this journey over the last few months, know that I did an episode about it, and then I actually took a couple of weeks off of life, in a way, to ride my bike from Maine. I originally was going to go to Florida, realized I didn't really have a lot in Florida that I cared about getting to, and so I changed the destination to Danielle's house in Charlotte, North Carolina, which put me just over a thousand miles and I did the whole thing in 13, 12 or 13 days. I took a day off, uh, one full day off to work, and then one half day off to work. And then I actually worked throughout it and did the client thing and did emails and wrote, worked on my book. Like really, I worked a lot throughout it, and my goal was to work throughout it completely. But I ended up uh, not not working as much as I thought because the pain ended up being more than I thought and just like the sort of emotional bandwidth and the toll that it took on me ended up being more than I thought. But instead of me just talking about that experience, I actually decided what I would do is just bring Danielle on to sort of host the thing and ask me the questions because I, n- I never I never know, like my own mind, I do, I'm so weird and I'm into such crazy shit that I forget that other people aren't into this like sort of lifestyle that I am. So I take for granted normal things. And so I thought that it'd be good to have her come on and ask me questions that probably a normal mind would have to contend with a little bit more than mine because I'd overlook things and I would make leaps in logic. And um, so I just thought this would be a cooler format. So thanks for agreeing to do this. Yeah, of course. So the first question that I'm going to ask you was probably the question that first came to my mind when you FaceTime me and you're like, I'm going to ride my bike from Maine to Florida. And my initial reaction was like, why? why in the hell would you want to do that in the middle of November? So what was the initial like thought or the catalyst that made you decide on this particular adventure? The bike, the, the whole route? thing. You know, every year in November, I it's something I do. I reserve a bit of time for myself in November to do something that stretches me physically. So last year I did the 240 mile run in body armor. The year before that, I did a 205 mile run through 80,000 feet of climbing in the mountains. Um, And that was the first year. So this was the third year that I've done something at the end of the year just to like really recalibrate my entire sense of comfort and my entire sense of safety. And so I started doing that regularly just because I find that if I don't, like I I personally start to care about shit that doesn't matter like I I just all the little things in life that like start to bug you over time I feel like I need to recalibrate my pain tolerance in a way just so that I can uh, contend with like normal stuff and like put it where it goes right it's like I think we go through life and really small things like the guy that cut us off in traffic tend to take up more real estate than they deserve in our heads and I like prize my real estate like the the way that I use my mind is like the most important thing in the world to me And what I find is it actually takes going out into that physiological discomfort in order to get the mind where it needs to be. It's kind of like that one meme you've seen that's like, or maybe you haven't seen it, but it's like um, civilize the mind but make savage the body. Have you ever seen that? No. No, I I saw that and it like has always resonated with me because that's the thing. I'm always like, man, I... I love to push myself, figure out what I'm physically capable of, but what I actually care about is the part that I get to take with me, which is all the mental lessons and tools and tricks and things that I learn along the way, which in this one I ended up learning, I mean, after 12 days of just being outside and in the elements and really just suffering quite a bit, you learn so much about yourself. There's no way that you don't. So for me, it's like that forced growth opportunity. So we'll definitely talk about all the learning lessons and such, 
But one of the questions I had was, obviously, like when you're doing this adventure, your nervous system is on high, right? All this adrenaline is going. Sure. So it's like a super high high. So when either, not even after you're done, but even during, did that exaggerate like the lows that you had? Like the extreme of the high, does that exaggerate the lows for you? Like emotionally? Anything. Mm. I would say yeah, because I mean, the the one thing I noticed about this this race or not race, but just this uh, event is that the polarities were super pronounced. So like there were times, especially around sunset, when I was feeling really good. It seemed like it took my body all damn day to feel good, and then somewhere around two is like when my legs like really legitimately felt like they were under me and I could ride hard. And so from like two until it was dark or till I got to wherever I was going that night was when I felt the best. And there were times where I was so happy. It legitimately, I was like, it felt like I was getting away with something that I shouldn't have. And then uh, at the same time, there were moments, I would say at the beginning of the day normally, when it was just like the lows were so low. And so, yeah, the polarities were really pronounced. There was like very little time that I was just like, oh, everything's fine. It was like I was either suffering or I was like really uh, on cloud nine. And I think that just has to do with spending such a long period of time on the bike. You know, you just end up going through both. So what was something that you did when you were in the low points and, you know, your physiology was going to shit, your mind was going to shit? Like what were things that you did or you said or... What was your narrative? I tried to, so I use my phone a lot. I would just like tap my headphones and talk into the notes. And so sometimes that like the translation was garbage. So like I look back at some of those notes and I'm like, hmm, I don't really know what I was thinking there. Like I don't know what I was saying because it translated such garbage. But the the thing that I'm, the reason I bring that up is because when I'm in a low, I've found that like when you're like suffering in life, no matter how it is that you're suffering, there are profound lessons. Like, I mean, really. And so one of the things I would do is like, you know, mentally, I knew I wasn't gonna stop. And that's something I would say for everybody going into anything hard, just commit to not stopping. Like, figure out what are the conditions in which you'll quit. And if you do not reach those conditions, then you keep going, right? And so that way it's not on the table. Because if you're going back and forth, like, do I wanna keep going? Do I? It's like, eventually you do not wanna keep going. There's too many reasons. Um, but that being said, when you find yourself in these moments of suffering in these really hard times, um, there's profound lessons. You have to be willing to find them. And so what I would do is when I was in those moments where like it really, really sucked, uh, except for the, mo- the shittiest time, like I was basically in survival mode on that day, which we'll talk about, I'm sure. But for most of the lows, which were like a lot of times I'd get like a headwind in the morning or something. I would add, I would just like start thinking of the lesson and honestly like me thinking about the lesson would pass enough time that often I would get out of the lows. So like one of the things that I noticed is like I was like really I, I think I told you about this. I was going downhill and it's like this it's below freezing. It's like 20 degrees with wind chill. The wind's blowing in my face and at, because my bike was so boxy cuz it had everything I needed to live, I would the wind would stop me as I was going downhill and it would like if I stopped pedaling for too long, like my momentum would just die. So it was like really frustrating because I was in Jersey, I want to say. I was like really far. I was like not even halfway yet. And uh, and so I one of the things I remember thinking is like, well, guy, every t- if the only time you notice the wind is when it's in your face, of course you're going to have a problem with it, right? And that's what I noticed. It was like, I was like, man, I'm only... That was like one of my big lessons, like when I was in that particular day of pain and I had to stop a lot because I just had to get out of the cold because I wasn't really that well prepared gear wise and it was just really fucking cold. And so I would get out of the cold and I would just be like drinking coffee, like thinking, because it's not about like, how do I get myself out of this? You get yourself out of it by pedaling forward, but like, what's the lesson here? And so that was one of the things I noticed is like a lot of the negative things I was replaying in my head. It's like, well, that's when you're starting to notice it. There's other times where the wind's at your back, but you're just like, you didn't stop to be grateful for that. So if the only time you notice the wind is something negative, you're gonna have a negative connotation with the wind. And so I noticed that you could do that with anything in life. It's like, if the only time you notice shit is when it's bad, then that will be the scenario that you play out. And so that actually does mean that you're, I think, the state that you pass time in is a bit of your choice because you could be grateful for those things or you could be resentful of those things. And so finding the times where to be grateful actually turned into like this 
time of me mining myself for better times. Like that's essentially what it turned into. So huge lesson there. So do you feel as if like times like that and all the adventures that you've done, do you feel like these are, you know, you you said that you do them so you don't um, end up doing like self-destructive, like unconscious self-destructive behaviors or whatever. Um, But do you feel like they're also like, the biggest catalyst for your creativity yeah and I don't really know why right like I mean I don't know why movement makes me more creative like I'll go out and walk like I walk every day for extended periods of time and that's normally because that's how my mind thinks the best um and so yeah I think my they are a catalyst for creativity I mean I know part of that is because BDNF right brain derived neurotropic factors increased when you are under physical exertion so like your ability to remember things is better. Your ability to connect dots in your head and create new concepts is better. Um, but there's probably, there's like a law of diminishing return on BDNF too. It's like at some point then you start to suffer and now like you're, you, you become almost useless in your creative ability. And I would notice that, which is why I was trying to take such good notes throughout it because I would go through a couple hours where I was like super creative and I was like, man, I'm going to solve the world's problems. And then like two hours later, I'm like, I can't solve my own fucking problems or get out of my own way. (laughs) And so I was like finding that it was super important to take notes and take advantage of the good times. So what do you feel like your biggest, I guess, sacrifices were during the actual bike ride? My biggest sacrifices? Yeah. That I, like, what I had to sacrifice? Yeah. Um, I mean, time with you, for sure. That sucked. Right? That was, like, two weeks of, like, not getting to see you. Um, and, I, and it was, a, I spent a considerable amount of money, you know, so that kind of sucked, too. Like, um, and then I would say, I think, also, too, like, sacrificing productivity just because, you know, I, I have my book launch coming up and I was redesigning the Clarity Academy but you know it's it's hard to say what you when you sacrifice something what do you get right it's like I did sacrifice that time but I'd also say that I came out of it with so much clarity and so much direction that right now I'm like I wouldn't give that back for the world so you do sacrifice things and I think most of our lives is just figuring out what we want to trade for what we want you know I mean right so you know a lot of at least the where I was raised you know, a lot of people think that the people that just like kind of can travel around the world and do all these adventures, like they're, it's kind of like a coping me- mechanism for some deeper issues. Mm. Right. So do you feel like, like what's your perspective on that? Because you're doing these and you're sacrificing money, you know, time investment into your business, but like you're also getting a ton out. So like, what would you say to those people? That, that would st- that think that like a nomadic life is I mean there are people that are running from their problems right I mean for sure I'd say who even could add a percentage but probably half of the traveling I've done is because I was trying to outrun myself you know um and even say even with endurance events like I have to I have to ensure that I'm not using them as escapism because I'll I I tend to use them too much and then I I was telling you about last night like I kind of break that for myself like I did that with alcohol in my 20s like I, I drank a lot but then they reached a point where it's like, oh, this doesn't work for me anymore. Um, and, and I don't want running and biking and, and my like love for endurance to become that escapism because it's something I get so much from. Um, so I am pretty cognizant of that in my own life. But what was the question? Like, what? basically, what would you tell the people that, you know, think that it's a coping mechanism for underlying issues, right? Oh, well, I think everybody's coping for things, right? I mean, I think that we live this world that's taught us that comfort and happiness are the same thing, you know, and and they're just not. So I think that, um, yeah, I don't know. I I think everybody's coping for something. And I think that this life is just an experience and it's however you want to experience it personally. And I've personally found that like life reveals its mystery to me when I'm in the depth, you know, when I'm when I'm suffering, when I'm in the polarities it's something I thought a lot about because um, a lot of people feel content to just sort of like live a a routine existence. And I don't know if they really feel content or if they're coping for something or like trying to shut some part of themselves off or if that's, you know, it's like it it takes all things. But I kept thinking a lot about the idea, uh, the ideas behind Buddhism when I was, when I was out there and the whole idea that like we're stuck in this 
endless cycle of samsara of death and rebirth and that and like all that it it's painful right because when parts of you die so that parts of you can be reborn one of the things we never talk about in the growth industry is like the part that dies like there's a lot of mourning that goes and like that was you that was part of you you know and and i real and i was thinking on this bike ride you know i think you could experience this life any way you want that's pretty certain that in 2019 for me i'm realizing i actually think the 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 point is to be more human to be okay with the polarities to live in it to not try to escape it like i i think it sucks yeah like pain sucks but the lessons are worth it and then for some reason they make the love worth it right and then when in the good times and then just like with you it's like there were two weeks where i didn't get to see you and i had incredible longing during that time like i was like wanting to be with you so much it hurt a little bit and i thought about that and i was like well but like longing i was like how what is this to me like what's happening right now this sucks why am i doing this and i'm like well i i think what i really came to was like longing was a celebration of the fact that something like that incredible like love like we have could exist in the first place and so I'm not trying to escape that shit, even when it sucks. I like try to sit in it. I try to feel it because I think I want to be more human, not less. And these kinds of experiences just sort of open up the door to do that. So do you think that because this particular um, endurance event you did without a crew, mm. so you did it completely by yourself. Yeah. So do you feel like maybe that's um, a reason why is so you could kind of feel that, I guess alone like you were alone yeah the whole thing totally um was there a reason why you chose to do that was that intentional like yeah because a lot of people had hit me up and they were like oh i want to ride part of it with you and i was like oh that's super cool and i like it was hard because i really appreciated all the support and people wanting to ride with me but then uh, i've had a solo and self-supported trip on my bucket list for a really long time like i've wanted to do that i realized all the other endurance events i do like the ones i talked about before I rely so heavily on my crew like to get me through not just for aid not just for like patching up my feet and giving me food but like like mentally like I rely on seeing a friendly face when I'm like at my lowest and just continuously going and I wanted to take that from myself because it's like I how much do I rely on that turns out a shitload right and so I was like no I, I if I'm putting my back against the wall I gotta be true about it and that requires me to take away the biggest source of comfort in the most uncomfortable times that I experience. And so that's what I did and that's what I got. And like, I think people, again, I, I say this, I've been saying it more lately, but I think we commit to being uncomfortable in only ways that we're comfortable with. And it's like, but that's not what growth requires. Re re growth requires the actual discomfort. And so when you, you have to be really honest with yourself about what's creating the comfort in your life and whether it's serving you or not. Now, this is just an arbitrary arena, right? It's like, it doesn't really matter, but it's the practice of stripping beliefs and comforts from myself that I actually wanted to get to, which is what is transferable. Like the, everything about this adventure, I focused on the part I took with me, not the physical part. Like that was just the vehicle. That's what got me there. But at the end of the day, like I was, I was actually trying to put myself in these uncomfortable situations and, and work through them, you know? So it, society today, I feel like really thrives on routine and like whatever that is to one particular person. So it's really uncomfortable, me in particular, when I get out of my routines, how uncomfortable that is for me. So did you like experience like a lot of discomfort there. I mean, you don't require like a really set routine, but you do have one. Yeah. So did you like have a particular routine throughout or? I did. I mean, so I got in a routine. I did yoga just about every night when I'd finish this like routine. So I built one. I had you help me with some exercises. And then I also found some like 10 to 12 minute post cycling yoga things on YouTube. And so I kind of like rotated through those. I had more plans for a routine, but it kind of fell apart when I was on the road because it was hard, right? Because like in the mornings I normally write, but I'm like, I'm writing and I'm wasting daylight and the days are short and I keep get, like fucking myself and be riding at night and it's like raining and cold and at night it just sucked. So I was like, I couldn't, I couldn't like mentally let myself sit there and write and like be all in it. Mm -hmm. And so I would say a lot of my routine basically went out the window and I found these like survival routines to do to like keep my body moving and stuff. Do you feel like that translates um, to like your ability to make quick, 
quick pivots in life when you have to like make quick decisions like that like oh i'm wasting daylight like i have to do this and then you switch mindsets 100 percent. and i don't know if you notice that living with me but like i think my well and we've talked about like my attachment style like i'm not attached to things like that like i i am really good at letting that stuff go it can hurt me because there's like there's a part of the spectrum where that becomes impulsive right it's like so there's like you know the full thing there and you're going to deal with the polarities like you do but i would say that um yeah i think it does i think it it translates and and that was part of it right like people it's people are always like man because i don't plan shit in my life like not really i plan stuff but only to like a high level and then i'm like out and that and the reason being is like i just know it's gonna work out it doesn't not work out like it this is life and it just it works out and even if it doesn't work out it just will work out later it just hasn't worked out yet like it's like oh, this isn't, this sucks. Everything sucks. It's like, we just got to wait. Like life's gonna, feeling complete and feeling broken. They're just as temporary as its counterpart. You know, it's like whatever you're going through is going to pass. And I think I know that deep down. And so like this trip, right? I didn't, okay, first of all, I didn't have, I didn't have sunglasses or a coat when I got (laughs) up to Maine. So for people that don't know, I just had my bike in Maine. And so where I grew up, and so I literally bought a one-way flight to Maine, got on my bike and rode it back here. That's like the actual thing that I did. And when I did that, I didn't know what to pack. So I had, I sent all my shit. I went to Amazon, bought like the stuff I had read in a blog that people would use for this had it sent and never even checked it. So then when I got home, I like had to put it all on my bike and like make sure it fit. But then I realized like, damn, I didn't bring a coat. I didn't bring sunglasses. I didn't bring anything warm. And so I like kind of bought some stuff and then just went for it. And so, you know, if I could redo it, I wouldn't have put myself in that tough of a situation because I didn't even plan a route. So every day I just put the, where I was going next in my GPS and just sent it. And in it in a bunch of times it, it fucked me because i like went out into the woods one time and it was like one day it hurt me real bad because i went like four miles out into the woods on this super rocky path that was like brutal and it stopped in the middle of nowhere and the sun was going down and i was like i have no idea where i am like the sun's going down it's super cold i'm in the middle of the woods and I was just like, I, this sucks. <laughs> so I turned around and I hauled ass out and I was scared that I was like going to get a flat because it was such a rocky trail and my fingers were far too numb to change a tire. I was like, if I get a flat, it's going to be really bad. Like, I just know how rough <laughs> this is going to be to change it. Because I had one night my seat fell apart on me and it's like this weird three bolt system and putting it back together with like numb hands was just at pitch dark couldn't even see like it was brutal um so i would have planned more you know if i were to redo it if i do another one i will plan it more but at the same time i got what i was going for which is i like to put my back against the wall i'm not in it like i'm not setting the record on time from maine to north carolina i never was going to i wasn't going to if i did it to florida and so sometimes i'm like that's not the part of the detail that i feel like grasping you know it's like for other people that makes them uncomfortable but uh i would just submit like that's not what i was in it for i wasn't like let me do this as fast as possible i was like no let me put my back against the wall and so that's what i did like my dad's like oh are you worried about it snowing he's like or no he was like oh it's probably gonna snow and i was like well i'm not doing this to like be comfortable that's that's why i'd stay here right like if i didn't want to be in the snow like i don't know so it was just Just being very clear on the intention of the whole yeah like what's success for you you know and that's a lesson that goes anywhere it's like people define success like you know for yourself and then then you'll know if you get it but don't go off metrics that other people use so i think that made other people more uncomfortable than it made me you know (laughs) put me in some effed up situations a couple times but it also like put me in incredible moments you know there was one moment where i went through brooklyn in the bronx in the morning across the George Washington Bridge into Jersey. I went through Delaware and Philly and then, or yeah, I can't remember. I went through like three major cities, but the morning started out in North Carolina, or I mean in New York City, and then it ended on this like 16 mile trail with tons of deer and just animals out there all by myself, just riding through the woods, like beautiful sunset. Um, And then I ended up spending four hours like riding in the pouring rain after that freezing at night. But so it was just like you got everything. And so I got what I asked for. So 
you know, when you're getting all of these different opinions of this whole trip and this adventure coming in, and even, like, I was concerned at certain points when you would FaceTime me, and I would be like, oh my gosh. But I tried not to, like, project that onto you and just, like, really be super supportive. But, like, you know, people are just like, isn't that dangerous? Are you, aren't you afraid? You know? So, like, do you have, like, were, did you have fears before the actual ride and then during like what was your biggest like fear that you had to overcome and go through so before the ride I really did not have fears like I mean <laughs> I don't know I just didn't think about it enough to have fears I think yeah. honestly is like I you know part of it is I've rely I've gotten myself out of a lot of crazy situations in life so I just rely on that sometimes like probably to a fault so I didn't have fears I was like Meh, it'll be fine I know it will and it was right so there's a part of me that says like Okay, still going. Um, during it, though, uh, I thought I was going to get hit by a car a shitload, like over and over. And it was like really frustrating. And I would say that was the hardest part for me mentally is like people I was, you know, I had a picture in my head of how people would be on other adventures. People have been really cool. And man, from Maine all the way to North Carolina, people were just total shit to me. Like, that's what it felt like. Like, I was just like such an inconvenience to everybody. And in my head, I'm like, man, I'm, you know, and I don't know what they're going through on the side of the, on the road. Like maybe they're late for, to be at the hospital for their kid's birth. Like I have no idea, but I do know that like I was riding like, you know, 10 to up to 16, 17 hours a day at the end, you know, and it's like for people to have to move their hands, like two inches to the left and then two inches back to the right and then two inches over to the right again on their steering wheel like to be that inconvenience and to like beep at me and like swerve at me and shit it was like I was really frustrated and it was like testing every part of me yeah so like what did you do in those moments to kind of help like that anger or whatever kind of emotion was going through your head like what did you do to help that like flow through you and like continue forth without the first time it didn't flow through me, I just pulled over, picked up a construction sign, and hocked it <laughs> off the cliff. Um, because what would happen is all the, these construction workers would put up all of their signs in the bike lane. So I would have to swerve out of the bike lane into traffic, which was super scary, especially at low light. And so admittedly, I didn't handle it the best at first. Uh, and then over time, I don't know, I think I just kind of talked myself down. Oh, you know what I did? Actually, the bike thing, right? The, oh, yeah, that's yeah. what I did. Yeah. So what, cause I was getting really mad. Like, I mean, four or five days into it, I was like getting so pissed. Like, yeah. I could tell every yeah. time I talked to you. Dude, I wanted to fight. I was getting so frustrated. Like just, I was just like, could someone give me a fucking break? But you know, I didn't ask for a break. Like I was out right. there. I was doing what I wanted to do. Um, right. but it was just getting frustrating. Um, whatever. It's nobody's job to support you. So I was riding my bike and you know what it is though? I was like, I didn't, I was like becoming, I was like becoming really angry and I didn't like it. And I haven't, I've put so much anger down since leaving the military that I was trying to, I didn't like what it was doing to me. And you know, I did this thing I told you about a while ago, I did it two years ago, three years ago. Uh, I rode my bike for a couple hundred miles and bought bikes for kids, uh, raised money and bought kids bikes for Christmas. And I remember when I did it, I was giving it to this uh, low income population and they were so grateful, but not all of them were. There was like a quarter of them or, or less maybe that were just so like, this is what you're giving me, like just so pissed, right? Like just not, not appreciative. And I just remember thinking like, but like I didn't do it for you. Like I bought these because I wanted to and I think your kid deserves one and he's going to get it and that's what matters, right? And I just thought about like the pure love that I got from giving somebody a gift that to me like changed my life like biking changed my life growing up whatever and so <laughs> for me every time somebody would like beat their horn at me or get pissed I just remember started thinking like man I'd love to give that person a bike and and it sounds so ridiculous but I rely on these little thought experiments to help me make sense of the world and this one really helped like everybody even if they were like a real dick I still would be like man I'd love to buy that person a bike and over time it was like because you know because what happens is we convince ourselves that we care about things that we don't care about. Like we convince ourselves that, that when somebody flicks us off, like maybe we actually, especially if you're like a guy and you're aggressive, like maybe you think you actually want to hit that person, right? But the truth is if it came down to it, what you actually want is everything for them to be okay and they most likely want everything for you to be okay. Now, that's not everybody, but that's certainly me. Like if I'm really honest with myself, that's what I want. And so that's what I tried to get to. I was like, 
whatever I'm feeling right now is a fabrication because I'm tired and I'm exhausted and they're tired and they're leaving work and like we're just mi- we're, we're meeting worlds in a really tough place you know and I realized like for me actually the key is like to just hone in on what I actually want for that person I'm like well I want I kind of want him to have a bike and so I just like mentally would do that and it seemed to like allow that anger to like really go away by the end I wasn't even thinking about it anymore yeah so it seems like when like you're in these adventures obviously and your physiology is just like so taxed it's easier to for those negative emotions to take over right so do you feel like in life now when you feel yourself I guess getting angry or you know negative emotions coming in do you feel like you're able to use joy or any sort of positive emotion to like help with that now after the bike ride uh what do you mean so like you used like the i guess feeling the internal feeling of joy to i guess yeah like to connect with it essentially like i connected with that like deeper truth right so can you do you feel like you do that now like just in your normal day-to-day life Oh, if I brought that with me? Yeah. A little, actually. I think so. I mean, right when I finished, I went through a real funk, and I don't know why. I think it was part of me just, like, adjusting to not being on my bike all day every day. There was, like, a three-day period where I was, like, I was stoked to be done, and I also just felt like I was in a funk. And I realized coming out of that funk as I was, like, getting ready, like, you know, we've I've made massive changes to the podcast and my book's coming out and stuff. And I think realizing all of the things I want to do, all of the struggles that I have, you know, getting a thousand people through the Clarity Academy in the next two years. Like these aren't, these are like real goals that are going to require like a lot of me. And I realize like I won't get there if I'm adversarial with myself or with the world. Like I have to, that's got to come from a place of joy. Otherwise I won't do all the work I need to do. I won't present the message like I need to. Um, And so having that realization that I have to like connect with that joy and that happiness and create from there, no matter what has been, um, I try to keep coming back to it at least, you know, I'm doing the best I can. So do you feel like that is the biggest internal shift that you had since your adventure or what do you feel like is your biggest internal shift that you've gone through? Yeah, I would say that, um, I found deep gratitude, just that is what you'd expect from being out there. You know, I remember the first night. The wind. The wind, yeah. Like, we're out. Okay, so it's, like, kind of cold. I mean, it was, like, really, really cold when I finished up. I, like, got super lucky and got to ride through a bunch of days of below freezing weather and wind and snow and rain. And I remember the first night that we were back here, we're, like, laying in bed. The window was open and the wind was still, like, ripping. And I could hear it against the corner of the building. And I remember just thinking, like... Man, I am so fucking grateful that it is the side of this building that's taking the wind right now and not the side of my face. Because for days, it's been my face. You know, like literally yeah. for days and days, it's been like my face. And I and we forget, I mean, it's so easy to think that this infrastructure that we have now is we've always had. And it's not true, you know. Mm-hmm. Like the reason that people are kind of constipated now is because you developed a shit while standing up. Because you didn't have a toilet for all of your evolution for millions of years, right? Like you, you squatted over a hole. Like you don't, people don't understand like all the luxuries we have. Like you, you did not develop for, you were not developed for those luxuries. You have them now, you know, and you're trying to put your condition, your human condition into them and we're adaptable. So it's working, but we, man, we take advantage of a lot of things that, that, um, you know, the world's harsh. And we're not good at hand. Like we're we're pretty fragile in a pretty brutal world. So to just look around and be thankful for all of the the sort of structure that protects you every day is like pretty great. It makes it a lot easier to get to that place of joy for sure. Right. So how would you define a life of adventure? What does that mean to you? Uh, developing a positive relationship with the unknown. So like on yesterday's show, I did a thing life as an adventure and I just like something in my own life I realized is like, cause I'm, I think about my message a lot and you know, to me, my message is the most important message in the world. And if there were a message I thought were more important than that's what I'd be talking about, you know? So like everyone's got their truth and that's mine. And I think that like what you really want 
in life is to you want a fantastic surprise. That's what you want. You want your life to work out better than you could have imagined, but you got to let go of what you're holding on to. You know, we it's so easy for us to fall into the rote routine lives that we we've created. You know, we've like been really good at paving the wild, and then we fall into routines on that pavement, and it's super easy. But I think what we really want is not we don't want like all even the success we think we want I don't think we actually do because we get there and we self sabotage and we ruin it and we're not happy anyway it's not what we want we want to be we want life's mystery to reveal itself to us and it does that through adventure at least in my opinion that's what it's been and that doesn't mean you need to like be out in the world having an adventure like there's intellectual adventure like have the balls to quit your fucking job that you hate that's an adventure you know what I mean and so I think. I think really it's just increasing a positive relationship with the unknown. I think that's what it comes down to. I think it's also too um, giving yourself permission to do that. Totally. You know, because I just feel like before we started dating, like for me, it was really hard for me to go out and experience life and not feel guilty about it. Mm. You know, and that phone call with my mom when she was like, "Are you?" Like, when I was, like, we had a trip to Denver planned, and I was, like, I can't afford it. Like, all these, like, limiting beliefs, all these excuses. And she was, like, are you just, are you going to let yourself have this? Yeah. So, I think that just giving yourself permission to experience the adventure is so big. Because I just feel like life in general with you is an adventure. Sure. Um, (laughs) Because I call you, and I'm, like, babe, I'm going to ride my bike from (laughs) Maine to Florida. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, and all the other things that you want to do. And it's, I don't know, it's its great though because it's really forced me to grow and expand out of my comfort zones. Mm. And it goes back to what you said about, you know, if people looked at my life, they would be like, oh, she loves to be uncomfortable. But it's like, yeah, in my own ways, right? Totally. But like getting out of my routines and traveling and we're talking about doing a 50-mile run next year so I think that that would be like a really good way to like prove to myself that you know you can put yourself through hard things and do it and then allowing myself to like actually participate and it's not about the outcome right you know it's about the experience right yeah and that's what I'm noticing right it's like on Instagram you're seeing it a lot it's like there's a lot of people out there that are adults that are not going to be pro athletes And it's like fitness is by its definition contextual. And so it's like, what are you adapting to? We got people out there adapting to validation. It's like you're not adapt Like the real, to me, the real beauty of a fitness pursuit, an endeavor, uh, an adventure like this, is that it's an arena to test yourself in and take those lessons to the rest of your life. If you're not doing that with it, it's hard for me to figure out what you're doing with it because you're not going to be a pro athlete. You're not going to, you know, it's like you, you get enjoyment from this. But I do think as a just as a rule we should focus on the part that is going to make the rest of our lives better and that's how do we handle the adversity that we get you know that's what that's the beauty of competing in something it's like you know i think you should compete in whatever it is your thing is because you should learn to deal with stuff when it's not a perfect day and competition is never a perfect day you know and so you you learn but you learn to show up your best anyway you know it's like when you're just training it's easy for you to be like well uh, i'm just not going to go that hard today or i'm kind of tired or i'm kind of whatever but it's like no, but but like build an arena and put yourself in the in the arena and test yourself as nobly as you can, and then that's what you get to take and add to the rest of your life, and the rest of your life becomes far better because you've learned how to curate those own those skills that make you adaptable, that make you successful in a ready made arena, and then you can go out in life. You know, it's like a lot of people are waiting till their house catches on fire to see if they can like jump out the fucking window. You know, it's like no, do that in an arena. You know, that was the. I think that was the beauty behind CrossFit when it started. It was like adapting to this unknown and unknowable life. I think now we've started to adapt to validation more than that, but but that's the original beauty behind it. And that's why I think like you talking about doing this 50, if you decide to do it, it's like, that's, it's such an amazing opportunity to like go through the full gamut of adversity because 50 miles is long enough that you're going to see it all. Right. And so you get to have those conversations with yourself. You get to test what you think. You get to test your abilities. And yeah, and that's why I do them. Yeah, I, I do think it is um, like who you become when, you know, life slaps you in the face. I think you're going to really like figure out the depths of yeah. what you need to work on, like the limits of your growth 
and that gives you kind of a, I guess a foundation to work from. Totally. So. Yeah, totally. I think my most probably like requoted quote that I had was out of an article that I had written a while back, but it was like something along the lines of who you become when you realize that no one is coming to save you is who you were always actually, meant to be. Shoot. That's actually one of the quotes that made me sign up for the Clarity Academy. Shit. <laughs> Full circle. <laughs> is that your last question? That was my last question. Man, thanks so much for doing this. I really appreciate it. Cool. Well, thank you guys. Uh, we'll talk tomorrow on Morning Talk. Well, you think there's a life that would make me bolder, but I'm wrong and scared is all. Well, I hang on everything about you. Well, you think I'd settle down because I'm older, but I roll with the changes all. Well, I'm same old trailer trash in new shoes.